where Francis and Martha were from Foster and Partners, and we're going to show you what our little group is doing within the office. We're like 15 people now. All of us are either architects, engineers, or both, but our common denominator is that we're all programmers, so we develop our own kind of applications. This is some of the areas of expertise. Franz, do you want to take us through it? Sure. So we're looking at sort of six core areas. Um, so complex geometry is always you know, where we sort of started. It's still something very common. Actually, how you, how you get the sort of unusual shape buildings built. Um, then I a huge amount of work on experience interaction. We'll talk a lot more about that later. Um, you know, we're not just driven by aesthetics. You know, we want to design, drive our buildings you know, for very objective reasons, you know, for, for, uh, so environmental performance, spatial experience. So we do a lot of work with performance-driven design and optimization. Um, and I think as many, many of the people have spoken about already, you know, collaboration is really key. You know, how do you get all the different disciplines to interact and work together well? So, and, and their software tools. So we, we do a lot of work on that. Um, and then a lot of work more recently on digital twins, on smart buildings. You know, how do we capture the, what's good about the real world and learn from it? And then speaking of learning, big new area is AI and machine learning. So we'll talk about that as well. And I mean, we're going to show you a little bit about everything. Our main thing that we want to discuss is about technology and the way we approach technology at Foster and Partners. I think in many situations we see people approaching all this innovation as something that is a challenge that they have to somehow integrate within their process, we like to approach it more as a possibility and see what it can do for us. How can we look two, three, five years in the future and see what can we do with these technologies? And this is not something that we have done like just recently. This is something that we've been doing for the past 20 years and Francis is going to show you some of his handiwork on that domain. <laughs> so even yeah, 20, 22, 23 years ago now, you know, we would trying to do buildings that really push the boundaries in terms of aesthetics, but also structure in terms of environmental performance. You know, these, these were really fundamentally green buildings. And at the time, you know, tools were a little less advanced. So, you know, we did some fun things. We were using CFD. We did a lot of early environment analysis with some of our consultants. But, you know, there was no rhino. There was no you know, uh, grasshopper. There was no sort of custom objects or, or sort of dynamo. So, you know, we used our 1D CAD system in the form of Excel. You know, now, very crude now, you can laugh at it. You know, we, we do this as a training exercise now for our, our sort of you know, new starters. But the key thing is, you know, you're using the best technology you have at the time and pushing it just a little bit further to try and do something incredible. So, yeah, that was then. <laughs> and that is more like now. We see that technology allows us to do things that we couldn't otherwise be able to do. Uh, what could have been the New Mexico City Airport was one of these projects where actually the scale and complexity of the airport was enormous. We're talking about something where each funnel is effectively only as big as the Bridge Museum Great Court Roof. And back then we had to employ people from Bath University to be able to actually do this dynamic relaxation between a rectangular and a circular boundary. Now we have a problem that is 90 times bigger in scale, but thousands of times more complex in terms of topological complexity. So we're employing technology to make sure that we're doing the right thing, and this is still a performance-driven design space frame. We do a dynamic relaxation, and then we're doing quite a lot of different, uh, we employ quite a lot of different mathematics to ensure that the entire thing goes from 2D to 3D in a natural form, and then creates the best, uh, the best form in compression. But then all this is not for the sake of technology itself. All this is for us to create a fantastic experience. As Francis always liked to say, we are in the business of creating experiences. And therefore, actually for us to be able to employ innovative technologies in our buildings is not for us to show that, look all the great things that we use on the background. It's for you to go into that building and feel that you're in the right space at the right time. And I think this sort of video sort of shows you this. And every time we do these things and they say, okay, what do you think is your biggest accomplishment in terms of how you created these buildings? We always say our biggest accomplishment is that we make very complicated things look effortless. So yeah, the, the ends justify the means in a, in a certain... So it is another example project, quite fun, very different scale. This is a pavilion for the UAE in, in the Milan Expo a couple of years ago. But quite, so we get some quite interesting design challenges. So in this case, the, the kind of call came from one of our senior partners, you know, Francis, can we, can we scan the desert? Okay, uh, yes. <laughs> so shortly there, if we had someone on site, scanning the desert. Um, so they wanted this building to be inspired by sand dunes and ripples. So we, we sort of you know, managed to kind of capture them quite accurately. The challenge, of course, is that you know, this building had to be reasonably cheap and modular. So we had to use a, a reaction diffusion algorithm, which is basically the same way as sort of seashell patterns develop 
to create a series of tiles that look random, but actually are very repetitive and, and tile completely around the outside. Um, so you can sort of see all these tiles are repeatable. So after that, it, it comes to how you build this thing. How can you rationalize it? So the best way we found to rationalize it was actually use quite a lot of optimization in different stages of the design process in order to ensure we have, for example, the minimum number of tiles that we can have that have uh, also minimum re uh, repetition. So one tile is not close to another. We've done a lot of optimizations instead of in terms of the outline of the entire building. All of that to ensure that the thing was going to be built on time and on budget until we realized that creating each one of these panels took eight hours and we had eight weeks and a few hundreds of panels to run in order to deliver uh, for the GRP uh, creation, the GRC creation. So um, very, very quickly we realized we had to do something very, very fast. So that was when we created our first uh, parallel computing system within the office allowing us effectively to run a headless uh, uh, grasshopper file at the time. We were running through Python and we were finding empty desks and uh, PCs that were not used in the office, throwing a headless kind of uh, grasshopper file there to run the model by itself. When it finished, it ticked the box, it found another computer to run the next model. It ended up we managed to do it in a week and delivered on time uh, with a little bit of anxiety, but that was the, the final result. And actually it was both, I think, the second best pavilion in Milan, just because it felt so cool inside, the entire shape created a really good uh, uh, atmosphere uh, underneath the really hot sun of Milan that summer. So if we're talking about optimization and we're looking at the optimization on buildings, we can talk about constructability, we can talk about a lot of different things, environmental criteria, but when you start looking at it at a much bigger scale, when you start looking at the city scale, there are a lot of performance evaluation criteria that you can look at that level. So you can have from sustainability to investment models, and all of this can drive how a city is built. So we are kind of started thinking, we run all these optimizations on a building scale. Can we do that on a city scale? And what are the challenges there? We thought if we have a particular road network and some typologies that we can change in a certain way, can we, rather than creating all these different, uh, un, uh, these different models and analyze them, instruct the computer of how to put a model together, then instruct it to run hundreds of thousands of analysis on of these hundreds of thousands of solutions, and then de deliver us with a solution space, which is not just one model, but a lot of different models that click, tick all the sort of criteria and the objectives that we wanted. So uh, we'll give you an example. We had the Guangmin Hub Urban Regeneration Project, and for that, the criteria that we had was we needed to enforce special connectivity throughout the entire site. We needed maximum views to the green from all the apartments. We also need to have very good daylight conditions and hit a particular total floor plate. Now, we could go, as I said before, and run these tens of hundreds or thousands of solutions, depending on how much time we had, analyze them all based on the analysis that we had, and then try to kind of find the best one. Instead, what we did is we create a recipe, we create a genetic algorithm that allowed it to kind of create these different solutions, analyze them, and then give us that solution space. And the good thing was that because we have developed it our own distributed computing system in-house called Hydra, we managed to do that for a city scale, not in a matter of a month and a half that we calculated it would take, but actually over the weekend. Not only that, but we're creating our own applications to facilitate people visualize what these options are. It's not good enough to say to somebody, oh, you have this like 100 options, take your pick. You need to understand what, how the different objectives are betting against each other and what makes your solution good. These are not just tools to give you a starting point from a good place to start your design from, but it's all, there are also tools that help you, they, they help teach people why they should make the decisions they make and help them understand what are the repercussions of their design actions. Uh, we're kind of uh, taking Hydra much more forward now. We're actually incorporating things like City Engine, uh, having, harvesting the powers of procedural city modeling directly through our models and creating much more realistic urban uh, designs as we kind of run our optimization. So talking about optimization, let's go down to machine learning and I will take you from the city scale down to the material scale, where I think this was now four years back in collaboration with Autodesk. We actually used artificial intelligence to predict how passively actuated materials 
could react under different temperature changes. So what we've done is we've used Hydra again to run hundreds of thousands of analyses to understand how thermoactive laminates perform under varied temperature conditions. We then took that huge data set that we acquired and trained the model to reverse engineer the problem, so to understand what should the layering be of that material in order for us as designers to have a particular deformation of the material. So we see this as a blue skies research for a potential of passively actuated facades, for example, when you might want a particular deformation in relation to heat or view conditions, and then you will get that based on the laminate um, layering that you will have. We have been using machine learning for quite a few things since then, and we have been looking at different outlets for that. One very traditional thing that you could use is for surrogate models, and we've done so. So again, using Hydra, we, run a, we generated a few hundreds of thousands of different floor plates, and we analyzed them very, very fast, created the data set, using that data set to train the model to understand what the visual and spatial connectivity could be within a space. That is important because usually this analysis for, for big floor plates quite, quite a lot of time to, to run. We have to keep optimizing our simulations to run them like close to a few minutes, but that's still not real time. With machine learning, we can get actually a prediction, which is, as you see, very close to the actual output that we would get from the analysis in less than a second. And a lot of you might actually be interested in machine learning, have, might be doing machine learning, and you know the problem with machine learning is not actually how you employ the algorithm or how you define your algorithm. It's mostly how do you deal with your data? Is your data good enough? What is the data that you have? Is it tabulated? Is it tagged? So there is a huge amount of work right now that happens through our team and with the office that has to do with how we deal with that data. So we create our own tools to seek data, seeking like 8 million files in less than two minutes in order to identify the right data that we need. We're creating automatic applications that can extract data and metadata directly from B models that we can then use for our machine learning databases. We have been even developing a natural processing languages um, applications uh, using elastic search to effectively index our documents and then BERT to be able to train a system to help us give results back, back based on a question of, for that fire regulation, what should be, for example, the width of my staircase? So I think you know, interoperability keeps coming up as a, as a real challenge in terms of how we, how we work as an industry. And we begin to see some off-the-shelf solutions like Omniverse and Speckle. We've actually written our own in-house system called Hermes, um, which started about sort of, what, four or five years ago now, mm -hmm. um, which we've been using on a lot of active projects. And it's proving to be pretty successful to, to solve some of the challenges that you know, are coming up. I mean, Greg this morning mentioned the challenges of sort of coordinating relationships and how there's nothing really for self. Actually, we think you, you actually have got some of the solutions. What this essentially is doing is operating a sort of a meta-parametric model. So individual disciplines are building their own parametric models. They define the relationships within their domains, but also with uh, to each other's domains. And then Hermes is basically allowing the sort of related grasshopper models to talk to each other and have a completely coordinated workflow. So by changing a single sort of overall envelope, the entire model with all the services and the, and the structure, the facade, regenerates. So we're going from like someone trying to manually model or team manually model a model taking a few weeks, doing so in a few hours. Um, so we think this is a very powerful way to work. You know, so it, it requires not just good technology, but also a very good team and good coordination. But actually, overall, it's much more effective. So just to give you a little ex example here. This wants to play. Um, oops, sorry. Always. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, so this is a, a project we were doing in, in Shanghai. So we've got a sort of a, a conceptual model in Unity on the left here. What we're trying to do is basically look at sort of views at a distance. We're trying to get the subjective experience at the top, you know, showing analytically what we can get. That then generates from a tower massing, generates a, a, a floor pit layout in Rhino, but also a structural analysis model in Rhino, in, in Diamond, in Rhino, in Rhino GSA. We can then generate a, a, a viable structure, show the impact on the views um, in, in this sort of near real time. And then the, then the end user can actually change the design in real time. That ultimately triggers an update in Dynamo and Revit, regenerates the floor plate, goes back into Rhino, 
maybe a structural engineer, let's have a look at it again. Like, yeah, maybe not. Actually, what this really needs, perhaps, is a, is a diagrid, perhaps, yeah, a, bit more, a bit more sensible. Um, that gets regenerated back into, into Rhino and then brought back into, into the Unity-based application. So it's very fast interdisciplinary design process. Um, so we really think this is the way we, people should be designing, not, not in silos. And of course, I mean, uh, we created that tool in order to break those silos. That doesn't mean that we're not always having an eye out for what is out there. Uh, we have been very keen on whatever uh, we've been seeing now with Rhino Insight and Compute, for example, and have been using it quite heavily in some of our workflows where we're allowing people to do particular things. For example, start with a 2D floor plate and just play with the floor plate. And we on the background work on the process, how these 2D floor plates uh, go into a 3D model and then a BIM model in real time also without the, the different designers having to work on the BIM model themselves. And that has given quite a lot of flexibility to a lot of the teams we've been working with. Another thing that we've been doing, and Kobus has actually talked about his presentation, uh, about this in his presentation this morning, was Omniverse. Um, Omniverse, with the use of GTC, has given us a really good um, platform to allow for real-time manipulation of a model and visualization at the same time. So while we're using Hermes and Rhino inside and compute mostly in, in terms of geometry, we have been using Omniverse mostly in terms of visualization. And we had some really excellent collaboration with, uh, with um, NVIDIA. We have been presented uh, from, by Jensen on their, on their kind of key, on his keynote. But we're now looking into things like digital mockups. And Francis will talk a little bit more about digital mockups afterwards. But how do you actually pay less money rather than doing the mockup, have a digital mockup that exactly reflects the materials that you're going to be having? What is the amount of money you save? And how many more options can you investigate as you're designing? I think a key thing to, also to finish on that is, is this is not a problem any one company or any one organization is going to solve. This is, this is an industry-wide problem. We need industry-wide solutions. So yeah, look forward to working with people on, on this. Um, so something also that is, is actually really critical is the interaction of people and technology. You know, a lot of software is, is not the most user-friendly, particularly for sort of non-technical users. So we've spent a lot of time over the last 20 years trying to break down those barriers, trying to get the best of, of interaction between humans and computers. Um, one of the challenges of being on the bleeding edge is sometimes you could be a little bit too violent. So this is the after project. This was a research project we did about 20 years ago. Um, this was a multi-user AR system with integrated analysis, with real-time links to CAD. Um, it was about 100k a person, and it worked, but uh, it was maybe just a little bit too far ahead. What's interesting, it maybe took us maybe 15 years till you know the hardware caught up to where to our vision so this is you know our system called sandbox using horror lenses um so it's it's sometimes you you have to kind of just be a bit patient because the ideas sort of take a bit longer to kind of come through in the implementations um we've also built systems called like this one called ipm so we basically have a multi-user system where you're playing with a physical model in real time everyone's very comfortable with but we're tracking that with three laser scanners and basically then can run analysis in real time, project it back onto it, you know, see the feedback. So it's very intuitive interaction, but the power of the digital behind it. Um, so we, we, this has been quite successfully used on a number, on a number of projects. Um, sort of a later implementation of this tool called Sandbox. Uh, 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 well, Sandbox is like our Minecraft in steroids that we build in-house. Is our newest, like one of our newest applications that have to do with performance-driven design. And as Francis said, as uh, technology evolves, our tools evolve as well. And therefore, now quite a lot using uh, games engines, we are developing these sort of interfaces that we try to make as flexible as possible. Not everybody's comfortable with using a VR headset, but people can be comfortable using a tablet or their desktop or um, AR even. And these are the sort of um, interfaces that we're trying to integrate with Sandbox. And uh, this is Sandbox like uh, uh, live. Actually, we're working on a team as we were recording this. We uh, were looking at the master plan, and the beauty of it is you start kind of creating buildings very, very quickly, and you can directly see the repercussions of your actions. Again, is this idea that these tools are there also to educate, to help younger designers understand what they're doing wrong or what they're doing right. So here we're checking the, the shadows. We're clicking the button, let's run a vertical sky component analysis and views to the green analysis is what we're getting. So the views to the green look okay, but then we're going right here, we see that there is a problem with the daylight potential in one of the buildings. We go, we delete a little bit, we, we make that shorter, run the analysis again, 
And there you go, you have a much better daylight uh, situation right now. This has not been speed up. This is real time as we kind of work in that model. And a lot of people have been doing a lot of things with sustainability criteria, special connectivity agent based, and we have been doing so as well. But what we find particularly interesting nowadays is how we incorporate soft criteria, like well-being index, embodied and operational CO2, or even financial value that you may have for one building. These are all things that we're now doing real time through this um, software and allowing users to have some feedback on that as well. I think another really key thing with this tool is it, it changes the way you can design. So Andrea hinted at this earlier, you know, that a lot of the way we've designed is very much sort of outside in. You know, you're, you're playing God with a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a scheme. So with our sandbox tool, basically we can have this incredible dynamic zoom so you can, you can do the kind of global sculpting, but then you can literally jump yourself right in there and experience it, what it's like at a sort of you know, human, human scale. And that's, that's really, really important, you know, both for design, but also to explain to clients you know, the implications of some of their actions. And uh, Andrew was presenting, and we thought, hang on a second, this looks familiar. So we, this is something we did earlier. <laughs> but it's lovely to see some similar ideas, sort of, kind of again, the idea of a sort of a doll's house. So you can, you can be in the space, but you can edit it. So I, I, I'm very glad to see some great minds thinking alike. So, um, but continuing on that thought, you know, at one point, you know, a lot of VR and XR is, is very, it's dynamic, but it's stationary. You know, you're in one place. Um, and... I think, you know, as, as uh, uh, Cahill from uh, Aston Martin said this morning, you know, still the sort of physical model is, you know, the sort of the, the, sort of the kind of uh, the ultimate way of experiencing something. So, you know, we make mockups, they're brilliant, you know, they, it's, a, it's very powerful, it's very multi-user, it's very intuitive to use. The challenge is, you know, they're quite static, they're very expensive. So what I'd like to show now is a new tool we've developed called Glaucon. So this is a multi-user collaborative tool that works at pretty much any scale, including one-to-one. -one. Um, and I'm going to illustrate it with a few projects. Unfortunately, the projects are still a bit confidential, so I, I'm going to have to let you, you know, I'm going to illustrate it with a few dummy projects as well, but uh, bear, bear with me. Um, so the first project we we're looking at, this was a, uh, a lobby for a, a skyscraper. So we actually took over a warehouse, which is about 100 metres by 30 metres, they, uh, our, some of our colleagues had, had built basically a one-to-one -one wooden mock-up and with our visualization team had built a uh, digital version of, this, of the space with all the correct materials and we put the two together so basically you could walk around this space experiencing it you know, having the tactile experience of walking around at one-to-one -one scale but seeing the virtual visuals um, and very frustrating I can't say the movie but it's it's truly an incredible experience to walk at that scale um, the other one was a planning inquiry we've just been doing, um, roughly a hundred meter by hundred meter site, and also this is actually live on the real site. Okay, so this is outside with changing weather, pedestrians walking by, you know, delivery people <laughs> cycling past, um, and the idea is, yeah, could we walk the client and the planners and the planning inspectors around the site at one to one scale, but show them what what the site would like with the new building on it. Um, some quite interesting challenges to do that scale. You know, VR headsets are very good. They're not really designed to operate at that level. So we did a lot of kind of custom development. But yeah, it was, once you try this, you, it's very hard to go back to sort of static VR. It's such an intuitive way of interacting just to walk, walk around and experience it. Um, we, we are, we're finding this is a very, very powerful tool to give ideas to people. Um, this is our, 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 our mock-up project. Um, but basically, you know, multi-user, you can see each other, you can point things out. It's really, it, yeah, it's really kind of quite powerful. I think, oh, one second. Uh, not playing. We also looked a lot at sort of what the right representations are. You know, you've probably seen various sorts of you know, avatars for different tools. Um, we settled on something which was sort of, you know, physically correct, if not sort of photorealistic, because the key thing you want to sort of convey the body language and the gestures without distracting people from, you know, does this, you know, have you fallen into the uncanny valley? Um, but the, you know, the experience is pretty good. We actually found the collaboration is very slick. And what's interesting is people are going from being completely immersed to then being sort of you know, taking headset offs and get, looking at look at reality. And there seems to be no break in the conversation. So normally you'd, you'd see some break in the suspension of disbelief. What we're finding is this is so seamless that people are just seamlessly switching back and forth without any challenges. You can see some of the fun, the kind of customised hardware we've had to put together, but uh, hopefully this will get easier in time. Um, but yes, 
really just, I think what's also really important is you've, got, you've not just got the visuals, but you've got the tactile experience of walking around, you've got the sound of the city around you. The, the sense of immersion is just, is just something else. And I think it's worth also thinking about the sort of broader impact of that. So, you know, the way we design the spaces we create in, you know, they of course have evolved. So this is our office sort of 30 years ago, you know, drawing boards, you know, 20 years ago, sort of hybrid office, <laughs> lots of paper, um, you know, this is sort of recently, in the last year it's been mainly teams, <laughs> but we think, you know, in the future we could probably see more like a hybrid office, right? So building on some of the work we're doing with digital twins, he says, sounds like, um, so we, we have a digital twin of our office, um, you know, we have lots of sensors in office, so we can, we're learning from how the physical space is working, we're looking at how can we use it for wayfinding, looking at, you know, what's the best space to occupy, but then we think we actually go beyond that, so what happens if you actually had a photorealistic version of the office, where you could bring anybody in, hang on a second, this wants to play, oh, no, sorry, my slides are being a little bit temperamental, sorry guys, Okay, so where you could bring clients in, you could start doing design reviews, but at any point you can say, okay, this is actually interesting. Let's jump to site. Let's actually see what it's like at one-to-one -one scale. Let's walk around a little bit. Okay, so you just complete freedom from where you are in the world. You could have people on site. You could have people, you know, in California. You could have people in London. You know, that complete freedom to experience the world at all these different scales, we think is going to be very, very powerful. Um, I think what's getting interesting as well is the sort of the the, um, the quality of you know avatars is getting better and better. You know this is this is some uh, meta humans from Unreal. It really is getting quite sorry. This is PowerPoint is being misbehaving. It's not perfect yet, but it is getting pretty realistic. Um, and our slides have gone. Hey, why? Let's try it again. Sorry, guys. Uh, well, the Jewish technology. Clearly, we and technology are not doing very well together. Yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, uh, I'm gonna start that back again. Sorry, guys. Apologies. Um, so yeah, the, so the the realism we're getting to is is getting very, very, very good, um, and you can begin to see, you know, how you could create interactions that you know you wouldn't normally be able to do i think also just on the hardware side now i showed you some of the sort of hardware from 20 years ago and now of holland it's getting smaller it's getting lighter you know, this technology is not going away this is this is really going to change the way we sort of design books but also the way we're experiencing it. so i think you know rather than just this idea that you're going to deliver the experience just through an analog physical building i think you're going to deliver the, the through a complete kind of continuum of analog physical building all the way to sort of complete virtual building and everything in between. I also think, you know, not only are our clients going to start demanding that, but also, you know, the climate might start demanding that as well, right? You know, we can't just have endless glass buildings. So, a pause of thought. So, we, I mean, think that was, that was us. We showed you a little bit of everything that we've been doing. Uh, uh, hope it was interesting. Some of you I've seen have been sleeping, but that's still good, okay, as well. And um, we are very happy to show you have shown you Glaucon because that's the second time we actually had the chance to present it and we're very proud of it. Uh, if you're interested to listen a little bit about more uh, about us and what we do or have done with Spot, uh, we are going to be in the next session in the main room uh, and you can come and see some of that uh, then. But thank you very, very much for listening. Questions? Mr. Cork. <laughs> Thank you. I think you've uh, blown my mind a little bit there with that. There's so much different information coming. It's, it's quite amazing. Um, I have a question about a lot of the technology you saw there. Is some of it's quite technical. Yeah. How do you go about making that accessible to less technical people within your practice? So I, I think you know, we are very agnostic about what the right interface is. I think we should have shown, you know, we, we would, you know, a lot of our tools will run on iPads, on PC, on VR headsets, AI headsets, you know. We've had stuff running with, with, with sort of Apple pens on, on iPads, you know. So and it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a basically, it's a sort of continuing sort of living lab. You know, we have 
lots and lots of projects every year. We do experiments, we try stuff out, we see how people react, we try with different clients, you know, and it's continually re- refining. And, you know, every project's different, every client's different, you know, you, you, you just experiment. I think it was to another point that, that Cahill made in, uh, from Aston Martin earlier, is actually, you know, you never take a tool out of the toolbox. You're adding in, you know, physical models, you're adding in virtual models, augmented models, you know, touch screens, you name it. We've tried it. We've, we've, yeah, what is the best tool or tool set that gets a good result? Uh, but also to mention that a lot of the things that we are doing, we, we are very much aware of that problem. And we as a team, and that's why we find it very hard to hire as well, is that we, we see ourselves as facilitators and we don't see ourselves as the super experts that will do this and everybody's going to be wild. We're thinking, okay, we can do this, but we want to deploy this to another thousand people. That is the challenge. How do you do that? So a lot of the things that we're doing is a lot of back-end development. But actually, we take quite a lot of time for front-end development and UX, UI experience so that we ensure that when somebody jumps into that thing, it feels natural. Like we've had, with Sandbox, we had five-year-olds and we had even Norman Foster using it with the same ease. But for us to do that, uh, apart from the actual development of the back-end, it had so much front-end development to make sure that this was kind of uh, viable and feasible. So we take a lot of care of that because we know what our audience is and we know where this is targeted and our, our role is to empower everybody else, not just to show off how great we are. And that's, I think that's the bottom line. I, th- I think it's also interesting about some of the VR stuff we showed you with GlauCon. You know, often with VR, you put someone in there within five minutes, they're like, well, okay, this is too much. We've had people use it for the first time and stay in there for sort of 45 minutes, an hour, because it, it's just so immersive, but also because you're physically walking around, and you're seeing your body, you know, you 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 feel very comfortable. So, actually, that, I think the proof's in the pudding that actually, if you have someone from scratch going into a VR environment comfortably for an hour, that's a that's a reasonably good start, we think. So, thank you. You scared them? <laughs> I don't want to hog the questions, but um... oh, it, it doesn't seem that they are like spilling in there. So. <laughs> Um, so, you mentioned how you're exploring Omniverse for collaborative visualization workflows, and you have other tools that you are using for collaborative geometry based workflows. Having two of those models or things in parallel isn't the most efficient way of doing things. Is there a, is there a future where you see a single system could handle collaborative geometry and visualization? Well, it's, it's interesting what you say, because for absolutely everything in the echo industry, what we always hear is about people trying to find the one ring that rules them all. And there is no such ring, unless you're in the Lord of the Rings, right? What you have is a suite of different tools that are good for different things. And I think part of what we are doing is actually to jump in there early on in the, when that is still a disruptive te- technology, and try to understand what is its positioning within our pipeline? How can we use it? We might make it, uh, we, the same thing happened with Hermes, like we've seen Flux and we thought we, we're mu- much better off doing it ourselves and that ended up being the right choice. We're seeing Omniverse and we're seeing a potential with USD that we haven't explored ourselves yet and we think that might be interesting in the future. I think there is a, a situation where you can not necessarily need to use one or the other tool, but different tools that do different things better. But then also, think that these are still early days about some of, uh, for, some of the th- for some of these things, and we do want to investigate the potential. At some point in the future, we might say, okay, we're going to do this holistically because this works better for us as an office. But we're not at that stage yet, and therefore exploring, investigating, and making sure we have our finger in all the pies at this stage is probably the best position to be in. There's a, there's a lot of good tools out there. You know, we, you know, we've used Microstation, you know, got Rhino, we've got Revit, you know, T-Unreal, you, know, you, you name it, we're probably using it. You know, we're using it for what the, the, these tools are what they're good for. We're integrating them when it, that makes a sense. But we're, we're very open-minded about, you know, what the, the overall solution is. And actually, more importantly, about comparing and always benchmarking, I guess, what we're doing. God knows, Franz and I have written like tools in our days that uh, we uh, we shed blood and tears to to develop, and then at some point something else came along that it was easier and better. And then I, I think we didn't think twice about saying, okay, we're scrapping all this now. It was good for while well, it lasted. It was useful. Now it's something much better. But you need to be able to do that benchmarking. Otherwise, you're st- getting stuck in your own views of how things are, and you can never move forward. You can never develop. Yay. 
Hi, it's a question quite similar to what the first question that was asked, and I just wanted to touch on it a little bit more. Um, you mentioned there about, you know, that it was more about the user experience that was the pull to use the applications and sort of research yourselves have undertaken. Yeah. Is there anywhere, do yourselves as a company also then focus on the change management piece and maybe the push that has to happen around changing the business? Is that something that would sit in a separate group? Would you see that as something that has to come from yourselves? It, it's something that we can sort of push, it's a, it's, but it is a push-pull thing. So we, I mean, we do a number of things. Basically, we, we do a lot of internal presentations and show what can be done. We have a sister team, which is the BIM and design system team, and they do a lot of, so they sit with, yeah, they're people sitting within the, the design teams, and so that helps sort of pull ideas in. Um, change management, is, it's, a, it's a really good point, you know. Um, we try and make our tools accessible, you know, there is inertia in any any industry, and so you know sometimes sometimes people grab stuff and they run with it, and sometimes it's like oh no it's not right. And then five years later they come and say actually, give us that again. So I think it's it's a sort of it's a it's a rolling process. But, but it's also something that you have to to like you have to win somebody's trust to be able to help them change their mentality, right? And in the past at least ten years we've seen quite a big shift. Not that they didn't trust us before, but they've seen what is. What is that we can uh, can be offered with some of these things? Yeah. So now they will like we will discuss with with them. They will discuss with us, and we will say this is where we think things are going. And we have quite a lot of uh, an open mindedness for them to keep on doing these things. And actually, what they're most I more interested in, that's the most good part for us, is that they ask us. They want us to deploy this through the entire office, and they themselves trying to change the the culture of the office to. Uh, integrate some of these processes. And and that's not a shift that happens quickly, but I think you need to work on it. And we, God knows we worked on it. And yeah. yeah. I, I think it's, you know, you know the, the, the old saying is, you know, you need people, process, and technology. And without any one of those three, you know, with the best in the world, things can fail. And so I think, you know, we're trying to do as much as we can, it's, but it, it is a sort of organization-wide, and it's frankly an industry-wide, you know, changes need to happen. So we're getting there, but it's, sometimes it's sort of, you know, <laughs> Well, to, to use my favourite William Gibson quotes, you know, the, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed, so, but it's coming, which is good. Um, it's a similar theme question, okay. but what you presented looks like, I don't know, we'll work over it. Thanks. Um, what you presented looks like the work of a lot of people over a sustained period of time. Um, so, I don't know, probably about 10 years, 25 people, I'm guessing, or something like that. <laughs> Don't know, but um, the what, what, I've, what I wanted to ask was, in terms of coordinating that, making it consistent, and building the toolbox, and making sure you're evaluating the best tools, and not uh, a series of separate initiatives. Um, I'm just curious as to how you embed that culture of bringing it together, and if there's anything you've learned from. Uh, I think the first thing is to make sure you have the right people. As we said before. Uh, we see 200 CVs to uh, call 10 people for an interview to potentially get one person. And that doesn't have to do so much with the technical skills that somebody brings on the table because there are so many clever people out there that in many ways we say that they're so much better than, than us, technically. Uh, but the point is not just to be technical good, the point is to be also fitting within a group mentality that looks what's best for everybody in the group and in the office and how you develop rather than, I mean, we're all ambitious people, right? But it's how you harness that ambitiousness for the greater good in some ways. So that is a big part of what we do. In parallel to that, we have been having, um, we have strategy meetings ourselves and we kind of create a, a strategy based on what it is available, what becomes available in the near future, and what would we would like to become available, and if not, can we create it? And that comes from us being informed about innovation around the industry and outside the industry, but also about what the teams are asking. And we're always kind of attuned, because a lot of our research is based on the back of projects. So we're very attuned to what the team needs. We're not like we haven't been like mushrooms in the office, oh, OK, now I'm going to do this. We have been working constantly on projects, and then suddenly we see the same thing coming up again and again and again, and we think, oh, this is potentially something that we need to look at. Or we see a technology like, we see something like machine learning, and we start thinking, this can actually solve quite a few problems. We just need to see it in a different way. So I think you need to, to have good people, and you need to be forward-looking. 
and you need to be in a situation where everybody wants to succeed in the same way. And I think that these are kind of ingredients for a good recipe and success. Yeah. And, and also be, be ready to accept, yeah, you'll do a lot of experimentation and you won't always get it right. I mean, yeah, we have a yeah, very small team of bright people. We, we sort of yeah, do a lot of testing, a lot of experimentation. A lot of it lands, sometimes it doesn't land. And, you, and you've got to be ready for that. And, and I think as Martha said earlier, sometimes you'll do something and then two years, three years later, there'll be a commercial product which does something better. You've just got to grit your teeth and say, actually, you know, it's better to use that rather than something in-house. But we are doing a lot of productization of our own tools in-house. But we're, we're, yeah, we're very open-minded about what the right solutions can be. I'm conscious we're standing between you and lunch. So, <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll be around the rest of today. So come and grab us if you've got any other questions. But thank you. Thank you.